Front Row Rugby. Interviews with rugby legends with Peter Stemmett. Today, you are going to get a front row seat to the legendary Springbok career of Yarpi Mulder. Yarpi, welcome to Front Row Rugby. Thank you very much, Pete. All right, before we begin the conversation, let's take a look at our trivia question for this week. In 2012, Heineke Meyer became Springbok coach. Who was his first test match against? Now, if you know the answer to that question, you can put it in the comment section down below. We'll also find out if Yarpi knows the answer to that question, but we'll do that at the end of our conversation. Yarpi, let's begin in 1994. You made your test debut against New Zealand in New Zealand. How nervous and excited were you at the same time? Yeah, it's, I can remember that day very clearly. And I got that call early in the morning. Uh, I was still at Rao. Uh, I stayed in a house with Francois Pinar and Theo van Rensburg, and they were overseas. They were already in New Zealand. And I got a call early in the morning from Johan Prinsler, who's the CEO at that stage uh, at the Lions. And he said to me that, uh, you know, I was, I've been called up and I need to go down to Cape Town, go get all my kit. So it was very exciting, you know. So uh, <laughs> I don't know, those days, I don't think the cell phones were too, there were too many cell phones around, so I couldn't get a hold of my folks, you know, because I, I need to talk to someone. There was no one in the house. So, uh, yeah, no, I, but I remember it very well. It was very exciting. I went actually, went down to Cape Town, met up with Oli LaRue. He flew with me uh, over to New Zealand, but uh, it was a, an awesome day. And, and, and what a privilege it was for me to, to actually play that. Well, it wasn't on my first test, but the second test match in New Zealand. Now, given the magnitude of the occasion, do you think it's fair for a youngster to make their debut against the All Blacks? <laughs> a lot of people have asked me that, you know, I would have probably preferred to play against Samoa or Italy or someone like that. You know, I was pretty, I, I think I was thrown into the deep end. But uh, I think that's probably the best way to start, you know, get the, you can't get a more nerve wracking start than that, you know. So um, I was okay. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't my best match ever, but uh, I didn't do too badly, I think. I think so. And you ended up becoming a Springbok legend. So I don't think it ended uh, or went too badly at all. So tell me, Yopi, you played under Ian McIntosh initially, and then obviously Kitch Christie came in to replace him after that 94 tour to New Zealand. What would you say were the differences between the two men in terms of their coaching philosophies? Yeah, Mac, what a brilliant guy. And, and same with Kitch. And I've, I've got respect for both of the, the coaches and the men they are. Uh, but they definitely had a difference in, in, in coaching style. You know, we had... Uh, at Transvaal, mainly because we probably, most of the guys were Afrikaans, is very strict. And, you know, there was, you used to, when you go into the bus, it was all quiet. It was quiet in a change room. So the discipline was quite, quite hectic, you know. And then when I flew in to New Zealand with Mac, it was a total different culture. You know, it was more than a tall culture. Uh, the guys were a lot more relaxed. And, uh, you know, that, you know, was, I, I found it quite strange, you know, because I grew up in Afrikaans school. Uh, we always used to be quiet, you know, you had to, show you focusing on the game and the Natal boys were totally different. And uh, I think it's, it's, you know, think of it in, in hindsight, I think it's probably the best way to actually approach it is you know, to, to try and relax. We sometimes tend to get too, too uh, hyped up about the whole thing that's going to happen. So, uh, you know, that was to me was the biggest difference between Mac and, 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 and Kitch, you know, it's just their approach to preparation and, you know, looking at the game and how you need to play and how we, you know, the two different, you know, uh, Mac was, you know, he was really open. You could, anybody could go and talk to Mac, whereas Kitsch, you know, it was totally different. You know, if you wanted to talk to him, it's like, if you only you go, have to work through France to actually get to Kitsch, you know, so it was a total different regime. But uh, I, I mean, both of them had, had, had great success. Okay, 1995 Rugby World Cup opening game against Australia. How nervous were you guys? Yeah, like I said, no one really gave us a chance, I think, prior to the World Cup, um, you know, but we, you know, the, the group itself, we you know we had a, such a great belief in ourselves. We knew we were going to win that game. And I must, we, uh, I mean, <laughs> that group of, I mean, uh, we were 30 in the group or 27 or 26, we are, in many we were, are. we honestly believed that we were going to do it. You know, um, you know, there's a lot of pressure playing at home, especially in Cape Town. I remember the morning or the afternoon we drove to, to Newlands, you know, and all the support links, you know, that's when you actually realize, you know, what, what the magnitude of the, the, the tournament is, you know, and, um, no, it was huge, you know, but the pressure, like I said, uh, we, I think it's as long as you believe in yourself and you believe in the teammates around you, you know, that takes a lot away, a, a lot of the pressure away from you, you know, so uh, like I said, and, and that's probably what made it not so bad for us to actually start and play in that opening game. I've actually watched that match back a couple of times, and uh, it's my opinion that we looked quite nervous in the first 20 minutes, especially, and then as soon as Peter Hendricks scored that try, 
everything changed. Would you go along with that? No, I tend to agree. I mean, it's like any test match. I think the first 10, 20 minutes is 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 uh, it's all nerves. But uh, once you settle in, you know, then you start feeling each other out and then the nerves start to settle and you can start playing rugby, you know. But it's true what you say. I think when Peter went round camper, which was probably one of the better wings in world rugby at that stage, you know, we, we I, I think just think the belief got a lot bigger that we can actually do this. Okay, let's move on then to the semi-final against France in Durban. How awful were those conditions? No, I've never played in conditions like that, Pete. Um, you know, I must be honest, I've played a few rugby games in my life, but I don't think I ever, I, I think I touched the ball once in that game. And uh, you know, it was awful. I mean, we it was just basically a ball of kicking the ball around and chasing. Um, that was a mess. I'm just happy we got through that one, but... I remember prior to the game, we all, I mean, I think they tried to start that game three times. And then the last time we went back into the change and they said, um, you know, if we, if we don't come out this time, then they're going to cancel the game. And obviously before the sightings we had with James and Peter Hendricks against Canada, we were going to uh, fall out and, you know, um, France would go through to the final. So we were quite eager to get onto the field as well. And I think the French were pretty happy to stay in the change rooms. And I think that's probably what made the difference. We wanted to play and they didn't, they didn't want to. Um, but like I said, like you said, you know, it was horrendous conditions. You, I remember you know, the people wiping the water off the field, you know. But <laughs> I think the referee, uh, they said at one stage they were worried about people getting or, or drowning or nonsense like that uh, underneath the rocks or anything. But, uh, you know, but thank God we, 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 did, we did start the game and, and it was tough, you know, it could have gone any, any, any way. Um, I think but the, the upper hand was on our side and we managed to pull it through. Absolutely. So, Yapi, uh, in the lead-up to the final, did you guys talk much about Jonah Lomu? No, no, obviously, you know, <laughs> it didn't take much because they, obviously, they, we played on the Saturday against France and uh, on the Sunday, England played against New Zealand. I think it was at Newlands. But we were all in the team room watching, watching that game. You know, we obviously knew we'd be in the final now. But that game went, uh, I think Lomo had probably, I think he scored three uh, three tries that game. He went over my cat and he went, I know, he went mal. Um, so uh, it went it, it went a bit quiet in the change room. The guys were starting to look at each other and say, what the hell are we going to do here? And, uh, you know, so we were very attentive. But, I, you know, it wasn't like we we planned the whole thing around him. You know, we, I think it's, it's a proper South African manner to, you know, each oak knew that, you know, I'm going to try and get to this guy because, you know, everyone says he's unstoppable, but he, I'm going to give it a go. And I think most of the guys, all guys on the field, were, were probably prepared to to have a go at Jonah. But um, you know, it was uh, there was a lot of talk around him. But I mean, he was a freak in that. I mean, he was a freak of nature in any case, in an, any rugby game. So, um, but uh, you know, we we stayed focused on the you know, there's 14 other guys on the field as well. So, uh, you know, we just knew that if he gets the ball, something special needs to, needs to happen. Now, Yavi, similar to that opening game against Australia, I've watched the final back a couple of times as well. And I'll give you my take on that. I actually think it was our best performance of the entire tournament. I think we looked very comfortable. I think the All Blacks broke through our first tackle maybe twice in the entire match. Um, and the scoreline, I think, flatters the All Blacks. And the fact that it went to extra time flatters them as well. Would you agree with that? No, I agree with you. Now, we, we, I never felt in that game that we were going to lose this. You know, well, against Australia, you knew it was 50 50, just well, until I would say the last 10 minutes. But you never felt comfortable in the, the opening game. But against New Zealand, I just never felt that these guys are on top of us, you know, like uh, uh, what you say, uh, you know, Ruben did score the try. Uh, he even he acknowledged that. Uh, so I think that the score does. A flat to the All Blacks a little bit, not by much though. Maybe an extra five or seven points would have would have helped to settle the nerves, especially that last twenty minutes was not nice playing that extra time. I would have preferred not to do that. Um, but um, yeah, I, I honestly believe we we were on top on that game. And now there's obviously a lot of rumors flying around with them getting po- or food poisoning and nonsense like that. I don't know what happened or what perspired, but uh, you know I, I could feel we were we were in charge that day. Yeah. It seems like the theme of your career, and certainly this interview, is all about the All Blacks at the moment, because I want to talk about them a little bit more. Uh, in 1996, you scored a memorable try against them at Newlands in uh, the Tri-Nations. Uh, how cool was that for you? Yeah, no, obviously, I think that's any schoolboy's dream or rugby player's dream is to score against the All Blacks. You know, and at that stage, um, I mean, they probably had the, they were a very strong side in 96. I mean, they came here with it. It's actually that same tour. They came here and they, they beat the Springboks. Um, you know, so, but for me too, to score against the All Blacks was a privilege. And now, every now and again, they do show that thing on TV and I still get a, 
uh, a nice feeling about it. You know, so uh, I'll remember that and treasure that for the rest of my life, Pete. And as you say, we played a three-match series against them after that, and we lost. And each of the defeats were actually quite close. I think the first test in Durban was 23-19, and then we lost at Loftus, I think, by seven points. And we were actually on their try line in the last sort of five, ten minutes. Why do you think we couldn't beat them in that series? Uh, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, you can go and find a lot of faults in what happened and why not and if not and, and buts. But... Um, you know, I, I'm, to, to pinpoint it is difficult, Pete. You know, you, it, it's all in the spur of the moment. You know, to go and single one thing out over the three test matches is difficult, you know. But, um, you know, it could have been goal kicking. I, I can't really remember. But I, I remember in 97, why we lost against the British Lions, that series was purely because of goal kicking. You know, we just never could. And then the point difference was also that, that, that small. And we just never, I think the big difference in 97 against the, the British was the our goal kicking. But 96, while we lost against the All Blacks, uh, they probably just a little bit better than us, I think. You know, they, man for man, if you look at the guys that played against them, uh, they had a very, very good side in, in, in 96, I believe. As, as you say, it's those small, small differences. But then on the end of year tour in 1996, we went to Argentina, we went to France, won that series uh, and played Wales as well. The Springboks seemed to be a lot happier, a lot more reinvigorated almost. Uh, what do you think was the difference there? Pete, you know, there's like, um, like you said earlier on, we, I think there's a lot of pressure when you play in South Africa and especially when the All Blacks are, you know, so there's a lot of pressure and the guys tend to make a lot more mistakes and there's a pressure of, you, you can't be the first side to lose a test series against All Blacks, which we bloody well did. Uh, so there was, there was a lot of pressure on the guys, you know, but once we, that was done and we all got used to that feeling of, of, of losing a, a test series. Uh, we were actually looking forward to actually just, you know, have a bit of fun, you know, and I think sometimes that's where us rugby players lose it, you know, you, you tend to focus so much on winning, you actually forget to enjoy the game, especially these days with professionalism, and that's, that's actually why you started playing rugby, is to enjoy it, you know, and in the end of the year tour, there's no pressure, you, I don't think we ever believed that we're going to lose any of those games, um, so, you know, you just go there and try and enjoy it, and I think that's the big difference, we knew in the All Blacks game, yeah, it's going to be tough, um, we thought we might even lose it. Yeah, a couple of games you're there, which 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 eventually did happen. But like I said, we never believed that we were going to lose any of those games at the end of the year. And I think that's probably, like I said earlier, it's all about confidence, and that and that starts brewing within the side. Let's stay in 1996. One of the most controversial moments was Andre Marcroft dropping Francois Pinar. And you spoke about enjoyment. Do you think that maybe Marcroft making that decision helped him to enjoy the coaching role a little bit more? Yeah, that's a difficult one. You know, for us at, uh, at Transvaal, it was a bit of a setback, you know, because, I mean, Francois was my captain since, yo, when did he take over? 93, I think, as, as, as captain. So I was used to playing under Francois. And then Markrov made this big decision, and uh, we all thought, you know, well, I would say the Transvaal guys probably thought it was the biggest mistake of his life, you know, but it, it, it wasn't. It worked out for the side. But I think these guys that sitting at, at uh, which operate at that level, Andre and, the, you know, your management, they probably have a look at your, the infrastructure of your side and see, you know, what's going to work for the side, you know. And, and, and you know, same with, uh, with, uh, with Nick that time, with, with uh, Bobby and, 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 and Gary. Same thing, you know, or, or US rather. I don't know who took over. Was it Bobby or US? Uh, US took over initially as captain. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and same happened in 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 '95 when uh, everyone said Tian Strauss must be in the World Cup squad as well, and Kitch decided that's not going to work because you're going to have two two leaders in the in the side, and you know that's going to probably cause a split in the in the squad, and which which uh, he didn't want to happen. So that's why I decided it's best for him. Not that Tian was uh, probably Tian was the best eightman, I believe, at that stage, you know, but for it was better for the side not to have him in the squad. And uh, that's probably what happened with, with Markov. You know, his decision not to to pick Francois was obviously strategic. You know, there was nothing wrong with Francois' level of play, but it's just something that, you know, <laughs> I don't know how these guys make this decision rather than, than me. But, uh, you know, it was a tough one, but it, it worked out for Andre, yeah. And earlier I asked you about Ian McIntosh and Kitch Christie. Uh, what kind of coach was Mark Croft? <laughs> Andre was more like Kitch, you know, they're very strict. Same as Nick, you know, they were, you know, they, they were on your case. You know, you, you know, Mac would come and talk to you after a game. If you didn't have too, too much of a good game, he would come and sit, talk to you. There's something that bothers you, trying to find out why you bug it up. Whereas these guys, they just have a go at you and telling you how rubbish you are and <laughs> sort yourself out and get it, get your act together. You know, they, they're very stringent. You know, proper, I think the Markraff, very proper, the old 
I would say the old Afrikaans manner of, of, of coaching. Um, but I love Marquis, you know, he, he coaches at, uh, at, the, at the Cats as well. I loved working with him and I, and I think he had a lot more to offer than, than what he did, yeah. And you mentioned earlier the British and Irish Lions in 1997 and we lost that series. Uh, but I'm interested to hear from you because you only played again in 1999. There was a, about a two-year gap. What actually happened? Yes, Pete, I had a lot of injuries. I, I think um, in 97 against the British Lions, I, I did my shoulder and I, I, I only played the first game against the British Lions. Then I went in for an up. Um, missed that all season. And then in 98... I think we were busy with pre-season. Then I, I ruptured my Achilles tendon. Uh, just got back from training again. Then I ruptured the other one. So I was, I mean, the whole, basically the whole 97 and 98, I was on the, on the, you know, on, on the injury list doing rehab. And, and it was frustrating, you know, because you work quite hard to get back onto the field. And then the similar thing happens again, you know. So I was very unfortunate to, I think, a good two to three years where I had a lot of injuries, you know, shoulders, knees, ankles, Achilles tendons, I went through, uh, it's a hard time, you know, because you want to get back on the field and you do put the hard work in and then it's just two or one game later, you're back to square one. Um, I don't know how I managed to get back from the Achilles tendon operations because they tend to take a lot out of you. But thank God to, you know, the medical team we had at that stage, they did manage to get me in some some sort of shape. So uh, I was lucky enough to get back in, I think it was 1999, I think. When did I start again? 98? Played a few with Mac, and then in 99, I had injuries again. And then played in 2001 again with Harry Fillion. Uh, we used the guy that dropped me, though. <laughs> I still need to talk to him about that. But in any case, uh, yeah, so I was, you know, I think from 97 onwards until you know, 2001, I was, you know, I was in and out of hospital and off the, the benches where the medical staff works on you. So it was a tough time for me the last couple of seasons. Was it also because of injury that you missed out on the 99 Rugby World Cup? Yeah, well, if you ask Peter Muller and Brendan Fender, they would say no. But I believe I should have been there. <laughs> um, and then I think Robbie Fleck was also 99. Yeah, so I, I believe I had a chance to be in that World Cup as well. But uh, uh, it was injury that, that kept me out of, of, of you know playing any provincial rugby. So I wasn't considered even for, for the 99 World Cup, I think. So your career straddled the amateur era and the professional era. And I think we all know that the guys in the late 90s and early 2000s were not earning the same kind of money that they do today. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was different times. Uh, I actually, like I said previously, I enjoyed the amateur uh, era a lot more than I did the professional side, you know, purely because we, we did a lot of training when we, when we turned uh, professional. But um you know, it was a different vibe in the side, you know, when you play an amateur, there's not a lot, but there's pressure, obviously, but uh, it's not this pressure from the union and everyone from all over the world expecting you to to, to create wonders. Um, but like I said, I, we the only thing we did, and we, we did train a lot in, in pre, you know, I would say when Kitchen and Ray Moore took over at, at the Lions, I've never trained so hard in my life. And we were still amateur then. Uh, I've never been so fit in that, you know, that three years that Kitch was at, at the Lions. Uh, but the one thing we never did was we never went to gym for some other reason. The first time I went to gym was in 1996, and it was be only because we we, we we turned professional. And uh, you know, my belief is that the moment we started going to gym, and that's when all these funny injuries started creeping in. You know, because the guys went. I mean, you can't get a guy and all of a sudden in 96 now he must start picking up all these heavy weights. You're looking for injuries, and and that's what happened to a lot of the guys. We weren't nurtured into the thing like these guys. I mean, these like these, these days, they are 16 years, they start gymming. Even earlier, 14, 15, they start doing gym work. So they, they progress into to a, a good uh, physique and, and, and be able to, they actually protect themselves against uh, serious injuries by doing a lot of gym work. We never had that. Um, but um, like I said, it's, 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 I enjoyed the amateur side of rugby a lot more than professional. So Yapi, who was your toughest opponent? There's a few guys. Uh, local guy, I, it was always tough pain against Peter Miller. And it was also, it was, you know, it was a physical uh, confrontation. Um, but I, I, I loved it. And, and uh, But I think internationally, uh, hands down, Frank Bunce. Um, also very physical, you know, his presence is felt on the field. You know, you must, like in those days, you must, even if you did pass the ball, you must make, you must keep an eye on because someone's coming, you know. <laughs> It, it, it's changed a lot the rules and, and, and you know the physical side it, it's it's also you know, made a huge impact on rugby I think the rules have changed so much 
But you can't do that intimidation side of rugby. It's, it's, it's gone away. You can't do that anymore. Uh, but I believe that's what made those two players exceptional. You know, they were very physical and and, and try to intimidate the, his opponent. All right, Yopi, so tell us, uh, what are you up to these days? Pete, we are uh, on the civil, we do construction work, but on the telecom side, you know, I do work for, uh, we built towers for Vodacom, MTN, and, 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 and uh, uh, who else is there? Celsi and those guys. Um, so, yeah, we, we build the tower from scratch up to everything standing, the towers that you see when you drive past. That's what I do, you know, I've been doing it for the last, yo, I think, close to 20 years. Um, had a few other endeavors, but uh, I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> All right, that sounds good to me, Yapi. Let's take a look now at the trivia question again. In 2012, Heineke Mayer became Springbok coach. Who was his first test match against? Do you know the answer, Yapi? Geez, like, beat 2012. Let me guess. Uh, Australia or New Zealand? Oh, no, I think Australia. Let's go for Australia. All right. The correct answer is actually England. We played a three-test series against them. Yeah, we, uh, we won the series too, so that's pretty good. Okay. Yopi, let me say thank you very, very much for your time today. It was a total pleasure having you on Front Row Rugby, and I hope that we can have you on again in the future. No, no, thank you very much, Pete. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, why not spear tackle the like button? You can also subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any content from Front Row Rugby. See you next time. Front Row Rugby. Interviews with rugby legends with Peter Stemmett.